Hi, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money, the beast, on your mind, or in your hand. It's one of those words they don't translate correctly. It's in this apocalypse. And I have a book that I'm going to talk about by Elaine Pagels. And uh, she mentions this mark of the beast in there. Let's see. Oh, gosh. Oh, I think I got the wrong one here. Oh, there we go. Okay, there it is. The Karagma. And it's in the Apocalypse. And the unabridged Greek-English lexicon shows you that the Karagma means the impress on the coin or stamp money coin. But this Elaine Pagels, I met her a couple times, one like a long time ago up at ASU, and then she was speaking at the U of A, and she's speaking this Monday. But uh, when she was at the U of A, I handed her one of these little pamphlets that I wrote. And uh, <clears throat> I mentioned how they dis mistranslated uh, the correct man there. Let's see if we can zoom in. And so Elaine, I just got this book to try to find out if she uh, mentioned anything in here that I have wrote about. And Well, first of all, I would say that the Book of Revelations was plagiarized because, like, at the very beginning and end of the book, they have, um, they only mention, like, Jesus at the very beginning and end. And then the mark of the beast is, is 666, and if you transliterate that into Hebrew letters where A equals 1 and B equals 2, then it spells Nero Caesar. The, and Caesar lived around 66 A.D., which is when the Jews revolted against Rome and started coining their own money. And so Elaine Pagels mentions this in her book here and uh, says that she mentioned the Aseans too, and the Aseans didn't touch, well, they didn't carry any money with them. And when Jesus sent his disciples out, um, he told his disciples to not carry any money either. So uh, that she mentions the Aseans. They sought to separate financially as well or to limit their financial dealings. And then I underlined all this part here. The, uh, require that everyone buys or sells with the mark of the beast. Let's see, how does that come into that context here? Uh, the beast from land trying to force everyone to buy or sell with the mark of the beast. That is the name of the beast or the number of his name. We do not know exactly what John had in mind. This mark may have been an imperial stamp required on official documents or perhaps a tattoo. I don't know why she doesn't, why she mentions that because there's a different word in Greek for tattoo on the body authorizing people to engage in business or participate in trade guilds that required members to pour libations to the gods or to offer grain to their statutes. John might also have had in mind the images and names of Roman emperors and gods stamped on coins, which he and other Jews bitterly resented. Some refused to handle or touch such coins, insisting that even looking at such dynamic images implicated one in idolatry. John apparently wants God's holy ones to boycott economic contact with Rome altogether, since he warns that anyone who receives the mark of the beast, whether this means accepting an imperial stamp, joining a trade guild, or even handling Roman money. And then she quotes from here. But uh, there she mentions joining a trade guild. I mean, I, I think she kind of, I mean, how could anybody think that? You know, it's obviously, she didn't mention how they didn't miss, how they mistranslated the word karagma, but if uh, they, there's other things on the internet. I tried to get the Wikipedia to mention that the Greek word for the mark actually means money because uh, karagma means money, like I showed you on the chart there. The Greek English lexicon tells you that it means stamp money coin. So, anyway, I guess it would be too big of a revelation to let everybody know what the mark of the beast is. And there's so many famous people that have believed in eliminating money. I've written the gospel of eliminating money. And if you go to my website, 
you can uh, see all these things. In fact, I made a little collage about it here. Let's uh, see <laughs> who believes my report. And that this is, I wrote this in 1985. There it is. And I just photocopied from books at the university library and I reduced it. I had a, they have a little calculator you can get and uh, looks like a slide rule, a circular slide rule, and you can proportionately reduce everything to fit in here. So I did all that by hand and cut it out with an X-Acto knife and put it on there. And then I had this part about uh, the mark of the beast on the top, because, and I quoted uh, Liddell Scott there. And Reagan is devil, and, and I explained that if you look up the etymology for the word devil, it uh, means to slander, and Reagan was a liar. He's a slanderer. He he said Gaddafi was um, doing bad things and bombed him, and I'm really upset because Gaddafi is one of those people that believed in eliminating money. He wrote the Green Book, and uh, I think it was 1977, and I made a little paper about that right after Reagan bombed uh, Gaddafi, he killed his little daughter, uh, adopted daughter. I don't, oh gosh, where is that? It's on my website. It's the Satan thing. And I compared the, um, how, uh, oh, who is that guy now? Oh, Friedrich Engels and, and Muammar Gaddafi practically say the same thing about when money becomes superfluous. When there's an abundance, you see, modern machinery was supposed to make things easy for us. Uh, see, I'm trying to make this thing go out, and uh, that's what they're talking about here. It's, uh, this was written like, you know, the industrial age, and they thought machinery would make work un not unnecessary. You know, back then, you know, it took 20 mule teams to bring water across the desert, and it took, um, you know, stagecoaches with horses. But now we have cars and airplanes and computers and just about everything to make life really easy. And um, it used to take a, a, like a real long time to harvest corn. And um, most of the corn is fed to cows and pigs. And, but like in Mexico, they make those tortillas out of this. So you can live on corn and soybeans. That, and they've sold them all to like cows and pigs, it's like uh, there's there would be plenty of food around. It's corn and so You can make a lot of things out of soy, but for like a year I lived on nothing but corn and soybeans as an experiment, and I put like a little pinch of salt, and I had a grinder, and I'd grind it up and put it in there. But um, yeah, a lot of famous people believe in eliminating money, and the Karl Marx did, and uh, in Capital he had a Art, an article in there about, um, I have one of his quotes on here, let's see, he's, um, well, Shakespeare, and, and like when they talk about killing all the lawyers, and the, the whole context is that um, when I am king, as king I will be, there shall be no money, and that's what um, Jack Cade said to the butcher in uh, Henry the Sixth, I believe. And um, well, this is what Karl Marx actually quoted. This. This is where I got this. Timon of Athens. It's really a good poem. And and um, Karl Marx put this in one of his little papers. I think it was called "The Capacity of Present Day Jews and Christians to Obtain Freedom." And and um, they. This gold can do all these things, knit and break religions, make the whore leprosy adored. It'll embalm and spice till the April day. And then he calls it the common whore of mankind that put us at odds among the Rada nations. And uh, he goes on about how bad gold is. And uh, it's like a lot, of, like Bertland Russell said, like when we reach an abundance, there's no need to have money to, and divvy and hoard if there's an abundance. It, like if there's a st st starvation going on, then everybody's going to 
ration the bread and stuff like that. But like, there's, you know, we're gonna really have to change pretty soon. You know, I mean, like this crazy weather we're having. It um, like 80 degrees in Chicago and the tornadoes in Michigan and and um, you know, droughts everywhere. The glaciers melting. It's like um, they're really worried that the oceans will rise a couple feet and endanger like I think six million or more. You know, because like Florida and well, New Orleans is below the sea level, so. If the sea level rose a foot, then I think, I can't remember if it said six million people or more, but, and, you know, some people are saying that the ice caps could melt even faster. So, you know, it's like we're on a collision course for mass um, movement, you know. It's like, look at all these houses that are getting torn down. I mean, a lot of them look really cheap. They had one on in southern Michigan on the news today. It looked like it was just... Well, it's sheetrock and two by fours, and it's real easy to build a house. It's like everybody should have one, but like the biggest slave system we have is this mortgages and insurance companies and uh, all these things that make you a slave, and like they don't have to be that way. It's like if we had standardized parts for cars and made the cars more durable so that a five mile an hour crash wouldn't wouldn't ruin it, then, you know, if we could have more cars that uh, are more economical and everybody wants one, so then they're the biggest source of pollution and also, like, um, the shortage of gas and that, um, oil, you know, like, we're running out and um, we can't keep up all this consumption. So there's so many aspects that kind of foretell doom you know, I mean, we shouldn't worry about these people being unemployed. What we should worry about is finding something for them to do. And, uh, you know, I mean, we should, well, half the people in America work at unnecessary jobs. You've got the bankers and the bookkeepers and the accountants and the sales clerks. And so, like, uh, these people could go to Africa or they could go to South America and teach these people how to farm better and irrigate and make pumps for their water and purify their water and teach them about birth control. But, uh, you know, we've got so many crazy people, you know, like if these Republicans and and Rick Santorum, and it's like so crazy, this world. Of course, like they don't, <clears throat> the elite, the, the elite plutocrats are afraid of democracy. They, um, so they killed Kennedy because Kennedy was aware of this. There was a speech that he did before uh, the newspaper guild or something like that, and they were, Kennedy was talking about secrets, secrets of, um, and things like that. I can't remember what, what exactly he said, but like, you know, he was aware of, of the problems that, that are going to happen. So was Jimmy Carter. He, Jimmy Carter gave uh, the Maylies speech. Uh, and then, like, he didn't get elected after that. He told the truth that we're running out of oil back in the 70s. And a lot of people have known, like, you know, this the whole real problem is this geometric world population growth. And uh, let's see, here it is. Uh, it just keeps doubling over, not, it gets even faster. Pretty soon we're going to have 9 billion people. Here's the United States population, and the way it would be if we didn't have any immigrants, it would be this pink line here. But, um, you know, the United States is, could be on that trajectory. <clears throat> but I think most of these Mexicans would like to stay down there, you know. This is, we're living in Babylon, and, um, you know, down in Mexico they have nice, farms, ranches, and it's very nice. I, I like the lifestyle down there, and they've got a lot of psychedelic mushrooms and things like that. So, and in fact, I think they've, like, I've heard they've legalized possession of small amounts of drugs, like even LSD. But you can see this is the way it's shot up. In 1776, there was less than a billion people 
So, like, you know, these plutocrats know that this is unsustainable, and capitalism is unsustainable because they have to keep growing, and and we need we need to have a different outlook, a, a sustainable outlook to preserve this planet. This is a very unique planet, and these animals on this planet are wonderful, you know, and we don't, you know, we don't need to have this, these big families anymore. They used to have a lot of children to help on the farm or to, for social security, like, so that if the parents get sick, the children can help take care of the families. But um, the problem also is these irrational religions, and Jesus Christ was the Logos, or the logic of God. That's another one of those words they don't translate correctly. I kind of wonder if uh, Elaine Pagels mentions the Logos in her book. I'll look in the index while you look at this. Like the etymology of logic. These are etymologies here. The etymo it means um, Logos, and, and it rarely means word. Well, let's see. I've started, I've read like a lot, pretty much a lot of this book, and she also mentions a lot about um, Paul. You know, I I think that Paul was one of the major re problems. Like there was back when this book was written, they John and uh, Paul were kind of at odds with each other, and they were both trying to sway the populace with their various interpretations of. Jesus' message, but uh, and uh, I think I mean John got it, nailed it right away. He he showed that you know the money is the mark of the beast, and like Jesus told his disciples to go forth without money, the Buddha told his disciples, and so did uh, uh, that guy Saint Francis of Assisi. He told Saint Francis despised money and uh, thought it was. Uh, a curse. Well, no, there isn't any, but no logos in Elaine Pagel's book. But uh, she does, you know, she gives a good history. I didn't realize that, you know, I've always thought that Paul was Antichrist because the things that he says aren't very logical. And um, I would just, if it's not of God, it, it doesn't make sense. And then it's not of God and it's of the devil. So, like, um, this whole church has been perverted by St. Paul with his stupid confess it through your mouth that Jesus is risen from the dead and you'll be saved, which is, of course, a big lie because that's not going to save you from the catastrophe that will happen because of our karma. You know, it's like this greed on Wall Street. There was a guy who just wrote a op-ed in the New York Times. He worked at Goldman Sachs. And he um, told, he said that, you know, the ethics there was to screw the customer or, or rip them off, you, see, you know, the rip-off factor. I forgot what he called it. There was, I think, I, there was a word for it that the Goldman Sachs employees used. And then there was another company that was in the paper that did the same thing, basically, was they thought of their customers as muppets or as, you know, sheep to fleas. And so, like, the people who make the rules, you know, the government makes the rules, but it, it doesn't have to be this way. And the, the sheep are just, um, you know, they're sheeple, you know, and they, that, that's what they are. So they're not aware of, of what's going on here. Like, with this 9-11 thing, there's a, you know, when I first heard about it, I couldn't believe the building would come straight down like that. And... Um, so I was, you know, skeptical of it. You can see there was a big explosion, and this metal was ejected laterally at 600 feet at 50 miles an hour. And um, there, it was all pulverized, all that concrete and everything. Well, there was a special kind of bomb inside there or something. That, uh, a lot of the first responders said they heard bang, 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 like there was a, a, an explosion, and um, so there, there's a lot of good videos on the internet about this 9/11 thing. It's 
kind of like the Kennedy assassination of my generation. It was a big shock, you know. When I first found out about the Kennedy assassination, it, the CIA killed JFK, and there, there was a lot of reasons for it. Like, Robert Kennedy was, um, he was the attorney general under, under John Kennedy, and so, like, he was cracking down on these acquisitions and mergers of these big companies, and, um, you know, like antitrust and stuff like that. And so, like, after Kennedy was killed, they started having what they called conglomerates, like um, Procter & Gamble or Philip Morris or R.J. Reynolds. They buy up other companies. I think R.J. Reynolds once owned Pepsi and uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken. And um, so it was kind of like a monopoly on food. And um, so now we've got these funny money scams, and uh, they've looted this country. But, but the, and the plutocrats have places to escape to when things get really bad. They have jets and yachts and thousand-acre ranches. They're saying that uh, Bush Sr. bought uh, 100,000 acres in Paraguay, which would be a very good place to go when things get bad. I think Australia and New Zealand would be pretty good places. I mean, Australia, they, if they could get like solar, uh, solar energy down there, they'd, they'd be doing pretty good. I think they have coal and stuff like that, but I think they could be pretty self-sufficient. However, you know, there's those hordes in Indonesia and all these other places. If the economy in the world, you know, like this oil situation, I mean, how do you think these people in, in Thailand or in uh, Philippines are doing with this expensive oil? It's gone up to $106 a barrel. I remember, I think you guys remember, I used to show you those graphs. I'm, I don't know if I have one, but like they publish them in the New York Times every day showing the price of oil. And for a while it was going up and I was showing you, uh-oh, you know, this is it, this is it. It's going to hit the fan, you know, and... But uh, it didn't. You know, we had this recession, and that caused us to not use as much oil. But we're never going to get out of this recession if the oil is expensive. And even if Obama opens up, like, the reserve, it'll only lower the price, like, three cents. So, you know, we're so dependent on these cars. It's not like in Europe they have good transportation, and you get around, this, like, New York City, too, and... Um, you know, you don't need to drive, but a lot of people out west here where we live have to drive pretty far to get to work and things like that, and it takes more money out of their budgets. You know, I'm in the real estate business, and it's really tanked. I used to be able to sell lots real easy, and now it's getting much harder, and I'm letting things go for basically what I paid for them just to get rid of them. My grandfather warned me of this. He said, you know, during the Depression, people had land and they couldn't pay the taxes, so they lost it. It's just, and I, it's kind of ironic because I got these lots because the people didn't pay their taxes, and now I'm going to end up losing some, <laughs> well, I, you know, some of these speculations. It's like I thought that, you know, like I played the game fair, and it is a game. Money is a game. So you just, um, you know, play the game, and it's a beast, and it's Babylon, but, um, you know, what, what else can you do? You can, if you're smart, you can get out and go somewhere and not have to worry about it, but if we're going to be stuck here, we better figure it out, you know. There, we could live a much better life, but the rules are made by these plutocrats who want everybody to be a slave, you know, like before they had unions, they uh, made you work six days a week, and if you got caught drinking and things like that. Now they want to pry into women's birth control pills in, in, in Arizona. There's a bill about this. You'll probably read about it in the paper tomorrow. But anyway, my name is Raquel. In order to buy or sell, you have to have the money of the beast on your mind or in your hand. Bye.